creators aren't getting paid. That's because powerful corporations have figured out how to create choke points that let them snatch up most of the value generated by creative work before it reaches creative workers. I'm Cory Doctorow. And I'm Rebecca Giblin. Our new book, Choke Point Capitalism, pulls aside the veil on the tricks big tech and big content use to lock in users and suppliers, eliminate competition, and ultimately shake down creators and producers. We also share tons of ideas for how we can recapture creative labor markets to make them fairer and more sustainable. Margaret Atwood says, we tell how the vampires crashed the party and provide protective garlic. But don't take her word for it. Check out our extended video or read the book for more. Oh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Um, it's so great to be back in Berlin and enjoying this very dramatic weather. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I'm going to start with March 2020. And I was in Melbourne and my life was cancelled, like all of our lives. We got a particularly special version in Melbourne with the five kilometres we could leave our house one hour a day and a curfew, all of the fun stuff. But at least in one sense, I was free because I was released of all of the obligations, everything I had promised to do in the grant application I'd written five years earlier because I couldn't do any of those things. And it, it was a real moment to ask, well, what then is the story that I have to tell? And I knew instantly what it was because I had just finished re reading this incredible book about monopsony. And this was a word that I wasn't familiar with, but it was a concept that I understood very, very well. And monopsony, for those of you who still don't know the word, um, it's the inverse of monopoly. Okay, we know about Monopoly because we have a family destroying board game that tells us all about that. Um, it's where sellers are very powerful and they have power over buyers. Um, monopsony is where it's the buyers who are very powerful. And so this, this, this book crystallized so many things for me and I'd, I'd read it just the previous month. But it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't a new thing. I had been in a taxi with Cory Doctorow in Melbourne about two years to the day before this. Um, and we had been talking about this same issue even without the word because we found ourselves united with a shared frustration that you know, between us, we had something like 35 or 40 years fighting in the copyright wars. And we were so tired of being told that we had to choose. Like, are we on the side of big tech or are we on the side of big content? Okay, and we didn't, that's a false choice. We didn't want to choose either of those things because we knew that whoever won right, in the war fought out by those interests, all creative workers would get would be crumbs from the table. And crumbs weren't enough. So for decades, we've had creators being told that they should devote all of their energy into fighting for more copyright. But giving more copyright to creators in, in this economic environment is like giving bullied kids more lunch money. Okay, you're shaken down at the school gate every day. The kid gives up the money. The solution is not to give them more, right? It doesn't matter if the bullies get so powerful that they can pay off the principal to look the other way, if they can finance an international campaign to say, won't somebody think of the hungry school children, right? We don't give them more lunch money. We give them guard dogs. Okay, so this is where this, uh, this, this book was born. Um, in, in that first month, March, April, I worked on it by myself and then it was incredible, but it was so frustrating because if you tried arguing with yourself, it's not a lot of fun. And I just started thinking, this would be so much better if Cory Doctorow wrote this book with me. And I don't know if you know this, but it's the thing you can do. You can just email him and say, Cory, will you write a book with me? And he'll say yes. Um, <laughs> so good he's not here he hates it when I make this joke he's always says please don't email me a bunch of people have now emailed him he did say yes to one more so you know maybe have a crack but no um, but it turns out he writes when he's anxious so he has seven books coming out uh, it was exactly the right moment 
Um, so I'm, I'm going to start properly now um, by telling you a story that I think exemplifies what we mean when we talk about um, choke point capitalism. I don't know if this is going to work. Can we move forward one thing and see what happens, perhaps? More pressing. We have a one moment signal. But I'm going to start talking anyway. So I'm going to start by uh, telling you a story that I think exemplifies um, what we mean when we talk about choke point capitalism. Um, and it's a story about the Amazon-owned Audible. So I know in, in Germany, it's a bit less um, endemic than it is in English language markets. But in English language countries, if, if you're buying audiobooks, you're almost certainly doing it through Audible. Um, and a couple of years back, authors in these markets noticed that something was up, right? Their sales were down. They were still financing, um, you know, really high quality audio books, but they were noticing that they were getting less and less, even though it seemed that the market for audio books was still growing. And they thought that maybe something up was, was up with returns because at this time, you know, if you were a subscriber to Audible, you would get these messages all the time, like they would be in the newsletter. It's just like, oh, by the way, you know, you can return your, your audio books, no questions asked, right, for up to a year after you've bought them, right? Even if you've listened to the whole thing, even if you loved it, and people would go on the, go and get the, the tech support and they would ask, and the, the tech people were like, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, it's, it's fine if you loved it. So people got the, and you know, they would finish the book and they would get a prompt saying, would you like to return this book? And so people started to think, well, if, if I, it's like a library, right? I return it, I get my credit back, I get a, a new one. Okay, terrific. But what they didn't realize is that every time they returned a book, the royalties were being clawed back from the author, right? And the authors weren't being told that this was happening. So there was no transparency around the accounting for this. The authors would only get reported their net sales, so sales after returns. So Audible knew that what it was doing was not really okay, and it was obscuring what was going on. But then one day there was a glitch and three weeks of returns data showed up in a single day. And so suddenly people were just like, what do you mean I sold minus 200 books today? Right? And they realized the scope of what had been going on, that there was this huge heist um, that was happening. And so what was going on here? So Amazon has actually, like this is, this is a playbook that we, we discovered as we were writing this book. We discovered that, um, that this was a playbook that Amazon had, had made famous with a diagram. They've, they're, they're so proud of it that they've made a diagram about it. Um, but we realized that it was a playbook that was being used in all kinds of creative industries, but also other industries as well. So Corey and I made another video explaining, um, first of all, how Amazon ex explains this and then unpacking what we think is really going on. So let's have a little look at that. Here's how Amazon describes its flywheel. Lower costs lead to lower prices, which create better customer experiences, translating to more traffic, which then attracts more sellers and thus a better selection. That improves the experience even more and the cycle continues. Amazon calls this a virtuous cycle, but it's not virtuous, it's anti-competitive. Here's what's really going on. Amazon's strategy has always been to lock in its customers. One way it does this is by putting digital rights management on ebooks and audiobooks, which cements readers to Kindle and Audible. Another is by offering fast free shipping to Prime members. Once you pay your annual fee, Amazon becomes your default whenever you need to buy something. Locking in its customers lets Amazon lock in its suppliers too. Publishers and small businesses can't afford to give up access to Amazon's increasingly large share of the market. So they keep listing their goods there, even when that's bad for their business long term. Amazon's lower cost structure is just a euphemism for shaking down its suppliers and workers. 
Amazon uses its market power to demand steep discounts and high fees from those other businesses as a cost of selling on its platform. It uses that money to subsidize low prices, which has the effect of eliminating competitors who actually pay fairly. As time goes on, that means Amazon suppliers have even less choice. Those low prices also lure more customers who then get locked into Amazon's platform as well. The shakedown grows more merciless and damaging as Amazon's flywheel spins faster and gains ever more momentum. That returns policy was about locking in users. That really generous returns policy was only offered to those regular monthly subscribers, right? Um, not people who just bought an ad hoc uh, one every now and then. What Amazon or Audible was interested in was getting those monthly fees no matter what. And they didn't care who paid for it, right? They didn't care where that money went. And so, if you think about it, anybody who starts up a, a rival audiobook platform and wants to actually pay creators fairly has really a big hill to climb in order to compete with this. Um, and Audible made authors pay for it. Like you have to admire the elegance of what they did. Um, um, but as I said, it wasn't until we were quite deep into researching this book that we realized it wasn't just Amazon that was doing this, this is the same playbook that's being used in creative industry after creative industry. Um, can we move to the, there we go. Um, so say what you like about capitalism, but competition is supposed to be fundamental to it. But for 40 years, we've been told not to worry about increasing market concentration because any time a company gets an advantage, it's gonna be competed away. But then what we've seen over that same time period is this concerted project um, of turning those supposedly temporary advantages into more enduring ones, right? And they've got really successful at it. And to the point where, and, and brazen too, to the point where they say the quiet part out loud, we have Peter Thiel saying competition is for losers and Warren Buffett talking about how he'll only invest in companies that have these wide moats, i.e. barriers to entry that stop other people coming in and, and doing that exact thing of, of competing in a way. And this is what's taught now in business schools, right? If you're in business school, you're told that, well, if you actually make something that people need or provide a service that people need, That'll get you regular rich. But if you want to get stupid rich, and they all want to get stupid rich, you've got to create a choke point. You've got to position yourself between the people who actually make the things and provide the services, right? And mediate your ability to control and, and position yourself between those people and the people who need them, and then use your ability to mediate access to extract more than a fair share of value, okay? And so this is the project, right? And because, um, and, and it's a little bit different in Germany, but because um, the globalization of corporations means that what happens in America ultimately ends up affecting all of us anywhere in the world, they adopted something called the consumer welfare standard right, as a, a new way of understanding competition law. Right? That sounds like very, very boring and dull. And you don't want to hear me talk about this very much at all. But what that standard said is effectively, is if, if it doesn't have um, the effect of raising consumer prices, the competition regulators aren't going to care. And so what that meant, the message that that sent to these corporations is shake down your workers and your suppliers. Now, of course, it has exactly the same end result, right? When you're being shaken down, right, when you're getting that downward pressure on your wages, you have less and less ability to buy the goods and services that you need, right? It's the same end result as if the prices had gone up, but 
in a way where there's not going to be any kind of intervention from regulators. And so in the book, we show that creative industry after creative industry has been choke pointed. Um, and they achieve their lock ins with different tools, right? Um, sorry, oh, there we go. Um, recorded music, they really use these like massive reservoirs of copyrights. We've got three record labels that control um, almost 70% of the global recorded music market. And they own three music publishers that control 60% of global song rights. Um, and they use they use that and because they, they have these rights for such an incredible long time, um, you know, it, it, it can be, de depending on the right, like you know, 70 years, 90 years, or over a century for the song rights. Um, this allows them to control the future of music markets in ways that they shouldn't be able to do because we don't need record labels in the same ways we used to. Um, for streaming, we see Spotify and Deezer, these other companies using playlists to try and get us to outsource to them the decisions about what we put in our ears. And then they are the ones um, that, that, that are deciding and that gives them the power um, over the artists. Ebooks and audiobooks, digital rights management's been very big and there's a whole range of other tools. But no matter what tools they use to choke point the market, when they succeed, it always results in the same thing. And Corey's term coined a terrific, like, w there we go. Where should I be pointing to make this a little more seamless in just randomly? Okay, to you guys. Okay, terrific, thank you. He calls this in shitification, right? Um, and when he coined this term, what he explained is that platforms, when they start up, they first direct their surplus to users, right? To get the users to come there and to want to be there. And then once the users are there, then they redirect the surplus to the suppliers. And then once they're locked in, the surplus gets poured into the pockets of the investors. Right? And the platform becomes a useless pile of shit, right? which is how we've ended up with you know, an internet that's now sort of you know, five services with all full of screenshots from the other four. Um, and the aim is to make it just this side of bad enough that you don't leave. Elon Musk has sort of fucked it up at this point with Twitter. It's just tumbleweeds now. Um, but mostly, people have been pretty successful at doing that. And we've focused on the creative industries, but once you start looking around, you start seeing that there are choke points and enchidification everywhere. So that's the problem. But I think the much more interesting question is, what do we do about it? How do we widen these choke points out? This is not, like, we, we were determined that this wasn't going to be another one of those chapter 11 books. Like, we've all read them. Like, 10 chapters about how terrible everything is. And then, like, one chapter at the end, like, we don't really have time to get into what to do about it, uh, but a bit of hand-waving about maybe vote harder. Um, we get really into the weeds. Um, and it's really important to know what kind of interventions actually work here. Because the, the traditional kind of competition law remedies uh, don't work particularly well when it comes to monopoly, but for various wonky reasons, they're much, much worse when it comes to monopsony, that excessive buyer power that we've been talking about. But we know that there are some interventions that do work, and they're things that encourage new entrants into markets, that directly regulate excessive buyer power, and those that build countervailing power in workers and in suppliers. Um, so I'm just going to briefly talk about some of these. And the, the one that gets me really, really excited is transparency. Right? You cannot fight an enemy if you don't know what they look like. Um, and that was exemplified really by that story that I began with. Right? The authors suspected something was up, but it wasn't until there was that data glitch that shone a light on what was happening that they really knew what was going on and they had something to fight. And that enabled them to mobilize. They created this incredible campaign. Uh, they had a hashtag AudibleGate. And they put on together enough pressure to get Audible, which is um, you know, as one of the 
Amazon companies, notoriously secretive, notoriously reluctant to share any kinds of information, did get them to provide more information, to separate out returns from sales, and to reform some of the most egregious parts of that returns policy so that the royalties weren't being clawed back in the same way. Um, we still don't actually know right, whether they're paying authors correctly. Um, and there's like reason to suspect that they're not. We need a lot more pressure in order to, 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 to figure out what's going on and to try and reform that. Um, but it's better. It's the same thing when it comes to record labels. You know, one of the, the, the quotes in the book is about this um, auditing company based in the States that had done tens of thousands of record label audits and only once did they ever find an error in the artist's favor. I don't, know what's, I don't know what's going on here, like some kind of isolated probability storm. Like imagine tossing a coin that many times and it comes up heads always, right? Um, it's very suspicious. Uh, the, the music publishers as well, um, when I was at South by Southwest this year, the songwriter Autumn Rowe told me her royalty statement is 3,000 uh, 3, pages, okay? 3,000 pages, she can't even figure out what a unit is, right? And she got such a headache, she had to go for a massage, and I think she said that the massage costs more than the amount of royalties she got from that 3,000 pages. Printing the thing would cost more than like the amount that you actually get paid. Um, and Molly Crabapple has, has, I think, put it really well um, when she talks about the effects of opacity, which is that not talking about money is a tool of class war. A culture that forbids employees from comparing salaries helps companies pay women and minorities less. Uh, we require transparency in a bunch of different situations, and particularly for shareholders, for investors, right? Um, so why don't we require this for creative workers? The systems theorist Stafford Beer tells us the answer when he says the purpose of a system is what it does. The Digital Single Market Directive has been really welcomely um, created new mandates around and new rights uh, that member states have to implement around transparency. I think this is a really great model. Um, the implementation is tricky because you've got these powerful corporations fighting any kind of meaningful um, implementation in every country. Um, but this is the right kind of thinking. Interoperability, really important as well. Right, you need to be able to exit the platform. Okay, um, that means taking your books with you, taking your audio books with you. We want to see, we want to be thinking about minimum wages for creative work. Right, any time you've got massive inequality of bargaining power, freedom of contract means freedom to be shaken down, and creative workers are particularly vulnerable to this because humans have to create. You know, the f we all know the feeling of like, you know, you have a story that has got to come out or a poem or a drawing or a painting or a piece of code. Our people's, people's passions are exploited to facilitate their, their uh, they're weaponized to facilitate their exploitation. Um, we need to see as well, more meaningful limits on copyright contracts. We need to have people less to give away. There's definitely another slide coming. Um, really meaningful reversion rights. Okay, time limits on contracts, use it or lose it rights. Again, the DSM's uh, heading in the right direction there. Collective ownership, really important too. And again, that's facilitated by things like interoperability, rights to exit um, platforms. But we need to be thinking about how do we finance this? How do we capitalize projects? One of the big difficulties that we face is that there is so little money right, for creative work. And when we, we look at the trade book industry, for example, it's particularly insane. It's absolutely bonkers. If anyone has ever broken down the economics of this, the, the answer is there is no money in publishing. But if we have a look at to the retail share, right? the part that Amazon takes, the, there's some wriggle room there. So we could be looking at, um, at cooperatives owned by authors if we were able to facilitate 
that to get started. And collective action, I think some of the most hopeful parts of the book are where we talk the stories about where that's really worked out. Um, and hopefully in the discussion, we can talk a little bit about the Writers Guild strike that's going on at the moment. We worked closely with the Writers Guild of America when we were writing this book. Um, they were ran for 22 months um, a strike after 7,000 Hollywood writers fired their agents all in a single week, right? And they managed to reform some really abusive practices. They're out again fighting tooth and nail for economic dignity and the ability to keep their, their industry afloat right now. Um, and the final thing that I want to maybe perhaps talk about is about generative AI, which is one of the things that the, the Writers Guild is fighting around at the moment because they're seeing the possibility that we're going to have writers rooms that are no longer vibrant places but where you've got a single isolated worker editing scripts that the robots came up with and the idea that we're going to have the humans doing all the drudge work while the machines are free to make the art this is not a world that i want to live in um the these technologies are not being developed by people who care about making the world a better place. It's exactly the same stuff, right? They're, they're there to extract value from the people who make the things and put it in the pockets for the people who already have the money. Don't believe the hype men, right? It's not going to become sentient, right? And it's not going to take one in every two jobs, but there are real threats, right? These technologies are going to seriously disrupt a lot of labor markets. They threaten to make the work that we do worse, right? They're going to be used to surveil us and to discriminate amongst us um, and to increase our disconnection from other humans. Um, but I think they also present a really exciting opportunity and that's what I want to end on here. Um, synthetic, you know, synthetic voice models allow other people to put words in our mouths. Um, generative video allows people to get our bodies to do things that we never consented to. These are intensely personal things. And I think they, they are personal in a way that focuses attention on what it means to be human and what's due to us as humans, as distinct to what's due to machines, but also as distinct to what's due to corporations. And so rights to self, perhaps, is a thing that we, we might talk about. We need to have a world where there's self-determination Right, where we weaken, and Corey put it, I want to end on Corey's words, that competition is about self-determination. That we need to weaken the power of intermediaries who would otherwise take away our ability to lead our creative and human lives in a way of our choosing, who would and do force us to arrange our lives to benefit their shareholders, no matter how badly that works for us. It's time that we recognize our commonalities, figure out who really are the class allies, and figure out how to live good lives. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Rebecca. That was wonderful. Um, we're gonna move into the panel discussion part of the evening now. And I'm very happy to be joined by Justus Treling, the policy director at Communia, an organization which advocates for policies that expand the public domain. And Sandra Trostel, a, an independent filmmaker and digital storyteller as well as, of course, Rebecca. Um, so yeah, we've got, we've got a nice combination of people, policy expert, creator, author. Whatever of, this is. Yeah, <laughs> too many things to, to say in one, in one phrase, but you've hopefully read the book, you understand what, where, where Rebecca's coming from. Um, and I want to spend most of the time today talking about solutions and the more, you know, the practical things that we can all do. Um, but just to start with, I wanted to recap a little bit on how the structures that you talk about in the book, Rebecca, are affecting how creative products are made these days. I'm thinking about examples that you mentioned, like um, how uh, music is being composed with Spotify playlists in mind. I think it was Drake's album that had like yeah, 20 song is four seconds long. Yeah, like <laughs> 25 tracks. It's just designed for streaming. Um, Zandra, can you talk a little bit about how yeah, uh, how that affects kind of the film world and what you're seeing. Yeah, I think it's kind of the same. And um, it's a little bit hidden because um, the German system is special when it comes to uh, filmmaking because it's all, everything, film I think is, is funded uh, by public money. So um, that, this, 
this is a point uh, what we have to think about. Um, uh, but it's not. It's it's always. Um, it's not um, funded um, hundred percent. It's an um, performance related loan, um, and uh, it's an economic funding. So you get perhaps for a documentary eighty percent, and you have to get the twenty percent from somewhere else. So you have to sell it, and you have to sell it. It's in the law in the contracts. And you have public TV, uh, which is also not um, paying for 100% of the um, cost for the production. So, and film is very expensive. So, we really relate on. Um, it's not working? No, it's not working. So, um, we really relate also on the people who. Uh, give us the money to do this and so this is the public funding and but also we have to sell and where can we sell so um, cinema is kind of I don't want to say it but it's that kind of um, the, the, the numbers going down and down and down and so um, you only uh, have the possibility to sell it online and um, uh, you don't get the audience if you are not with the big streamers and they tell you what they want. They tell you the formats, they tell you the content, they tell you uh, uh, the, the way how you have to make it, the drama. And uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker, so I think this is especially difficult because we're talking about culture. And um, so... Yeah, that's kind of the situation. I could talk about this for the next three hours, but you don't <laughs> want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Thanks so much, Sandra. Um, Justus, Communia has a set of policy recommendations relating to the policy to public domain. Number seven being the freedom to create should be protected at the EU level. I feel like that's ultimately what we're talking about in lots of ways here. Um, could you tell us more about what that looks like in practical terms and what drove you to come up with that one? Yeah, I, I think, thank you very much. I mean, that, that one in particular is maybe um, a, a bit tricky because it actually um, re relates to, um, you know, um, different things maybe um, in, in, in terms of um, how we can use platforms, etc. But I think what we advocate for and what, what I think is really um, interesting uh, directly connects to what uh, Rebecca has said, which is transparency. So um, those policy recommendations, we came up with them um, after copyright reform, after the Digital Single Market Directive was passed, uh, now I think four years ago. And um, we thought, okay, um, what can we, can we ask for um, for the next decade, basically, uh, to make European copyright better for users, but also for creators. And, and I think uh, that was really crucial for us because we also felt that the narrative was pretty much you have to decide and you, you get this false choice that you mentioned. You have to decide whether you're on the side of, of big tech, basically, or uh, on the side of big content because basically um, creation was, was seen as something that, that was only supported by big content. Right? And, and um, you had all this talk of, of the value gap in the EU, and that's how we got the, uh, the upload filter debate, of course, right? I mean, um, everybody will remember that, that part. Um, and I think you, you do a great job in the book where you describe this as, as basically um, further locking us in on the YouTube model. Um, because, mm -hmm. I mean, upload filters ultimately mean that you have to have the technology uh, to run a platform. And who has the technology? Well, you know, uh, one company has mastered content ID and that kind of locks you in uh, on, on their business model. And I think just uh, to finish my thought here, what, what we said is basically we, if, if we want to break this, um, this pattern, um, we, we really need to um, ensure that creators can again connect with their audiences and understand who's listening to their content, who's watching their content, who's reading their books, etc. Um, and that's why we also very strongly push for, for transparency uh, in, in those recommendations. Do you want to add? No. Um, I might mention that actually in the film industry in the UK, they have something called Terms of Trade, which is it was introduced yeah. in the early 2000s. Do you have anything like that here? 
Yeah, we yeah. have, but um, a, a lawyer once told me we, we missed this. Oh, we missed it, <laughs> Kind okay. of. So we, ha we have it, but it's not that strong. Okay, so, so like the, the UK, I'm going to tell you a tiny bit about this UK example because it has really turned things around and I think it can provide inspiration for us in, in other areas as well. So what they realized is that in sort of the early 2000s, the big public broadcasters in the UK, like the BBC and all of those, those other ones, um, they, were, they were buying, they were commissioning film and then they were like, they had these, these contracts that were just really broad um, and kind of took everything. But they weren't really using everything. Like just because you take something, and we see this in so many different creative markets, doesn't mean you're actually going to exploit it. Um, lots of people have asked us about a German edition of the book. We do not have a German edition of the book. I cannot sell a German edition of a book to a publisher because our, our US publisher has the world rights. Um, <laughs> and they haven't managed to sell a German edition. Um, but in the UK, they, cha they, cr they decided that they were going to change the rules. And so they created this thing called Terms of Trade that said that the, the, when the, the public broadcasters commissioned things from independent producers, they were only able to do it on certain terms. So, for example, they weren't allowed to just take all the international rights as well. So they separated out the, the domestic commission from the international rights. Um, and they, they also restricted other things. So there's other things you can do, like restrict the time that, the, that they have the rights, um, change, uh, there's the, the, the entitlement to, to stream it and, and the entitlement to put it on the, the, the broadcast television and so on. So separated all of these things out and said you have to bargain for it separately and you have to keep bargaining for it, okay? If you want to keep putting this on your, your online player for people to view, right, you, you buy those rights again. And this has m had a massively beneficial effect on the independent production sector in the, in the UK. Um, they've massively increase their exports of UK material because those the people who actually make it really care about getting it out there and they do actually exploit those rights. They're out there hustling, right? And when when the, the, the media is still being um, viewed and sold, then they've got the ability to keep selling it um, domestically as well. And so I think that breaking the rights up like, what, like that, um, and that's what I'm, when we're talking about like having meaningful reversion rights, um, and, and limits, like freedom to contract sounds really, really nice until you think about what that actually means in practice. Um, and I'd like yeah. to... But yeah, we, we have something similar, but not that strong, as mm -hmm. I said before. But at the end, um, for me as a creative person, I, uh, if I work with a producer, I normally produce myself. Mm -hmm. But if I work with a producer, normally I, I, have, I, also, I ever have a total buyout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it's good for the producer and they're also struggling, the mm -hmm. independent producers, you know, but um, then we have to go a step further mm -hmm. and to have also these um, terms of trade for the creative people. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. So we're, um, we're sitting here at Wikimedia. Um, Wikipedia is, as you know, volunteer-driven creation of free knowledge. I'm curious how you all see the interplay between volunteer-driven initiatives um, designed at promoting knowledge free of charge and creating creating open knowledge in that sense and the challenging circumstances that you describe in the book. Um, so I, th I think what I ended on, um, I suppose, was just hinting at this idea of, of what is it that, that makes for a good life, right? And I think that humans are terrible about knowing what that actually is. We're very resilient, okay? Um, but... You know, did it have this in Germany, this idea that of, of the frog in the pot of water and it gets warmer and warmer and warmer and the frog never jumps out? This is bullshit. <laughs> the frog jumps out. But do you know who doesn't jump out? Humans. <laughs> like we, we, we let our pot get warmer and warmer and warmer and we don't jump out. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think um, when I think about Wikipedia and I think about what drives it, it's this human urge towards cooperatism, um, to making the world better for each other. People do it um, for many, many, um, uh, from many, many intrinsic motivations that are not the things that we're told that we, we, we need to be driven by. And I think that's really similar to why a lot of people create other stuff that, that we love um, as well. And like to me, <laughs> art and culture are the, the things that make it bearable to be human. Um, but somehow, even though it's the most important thing, it's the thing that we don't put an economic value on it. And it's almost like 
we have to, because humans are inherently cooperative and, and creative, um, we don't have to pay them to do that, but we do have to pe pay people a lot of money to to disconnect and to extract and to to, to to like be the inverse of that. So that's why you need to give so much money to corporate lawyers and the merger and takeover people and the all of the assholes. And even then, when they have enough money, right, then all they want to do is like start a candle making business in their bathroom or like give it all away through a a, 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 a charity or some such. So what I what I think. I see the relationship as is that there there is such strong motivations, human motivations to 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 connect, to be part of a bigger project, um, and what we have to do is find a path through that enables us to do more of that and to understand what really is valuable. Um, and I think that's. I'm just going to blame this. Uh, incoherency on the fact that I just arrived from Australia a few days ago and haven't stopped since. <laughs> You're doing great. But hopefully there is something that made sense in that. Maybe Eustace, you could uh, fix no, I it. Mean, I, I, <laughs> there, there, there's nothing to fix, really. I think that that's, that's true. I mean, um, I think we have those projects and they kind of stand in, in contrast to the, the, the business model of the, the large tech, the, the big tech platforms uh, in, in a way that we see that, as you said, people want to cooperate, people want to jointly create content, people want to create something for others to enjoy, basically, uh, even without asking for remuneration. And I think the, the challenging um, and unfortunate part is that sometimes rules stand in the way of that, right? Mm -hmm. Not just rules, also kind of um, societal structures like, uh, you know, co corporations, uh, but but also just laws. I mean, um, if we look, for example, at a copyright, I mean, sometimes it, it becomes very challenging um, to use certain kinds of content on Wikipedia, Wikicoms in particular. But um, and, and, and that for us, I mean, I, I think should be, um, you know, um, yeah, that, that for us is a reason to, to become active in, in policy work, also to remove those barriers and, and make it easier uh, to create on, on, on those platforms. Because I think ultimately we want to further those structures um, mm -hmm. that really help us come together as a society and build something useful on the internet and not just consume the stupid content all over again. And I think that really relates to your first question, the, the freedom to create is kind of, our idea is there, um, that, that people should be um, able to, for example, remix um, and reuse content that is already there. And that is notoriously difficult, especially if it's copyrighted content. I mean, there are some good reasons for that, but there's also some bad reasons for that. So if you want to you know, uh, create a hip hop song, use some samples, uh, good luck. I mean, um, <laughs> if you're not Drake <laughs> or somebody like that, um, I think you're not going to succeed, even if it's just for pleasure and, and not to generate income off of that. So, um, and, and there we can really see, I think, some, some examples where, um, you know, our laws could be better, our copyright rules, I think, in particular could be better, um, yeah, to, to enable um, th this kind of co-creation. Could I just, I'll oh, say, go ahead. I also wanted to add something. Um, I, I told you before that um, uh, we really depend on public money. So um, I did an experiment once with a film and uh, I said to the people, okay, if it's financed 100%, so it's something like a total buyout. Um, you know, total buyout is normally more because you have to uh, uh, count in all the social things. And um, so I said I gave it away for under, under Creative Commons license and um, this worked, <laughs> you know, with the financing, but I managed to do it. And um, yeah, at the end, it was really good for me because I make movies um, for watching them and not for the draw of the distributor. And uh, so, um, um, but on the other side, uh, I try to uh, publish it under Creative Commons and for movies it's really difficult. At the end I ended on Wiki Commons, but this was also really, uh, really difficult because it's not made for it. And I think it would be good all these projects, for example, like Wikipedia, um, you know, to push them a little bit more into, into a place where, um, where you can ex we can you you can do stuff like this yeah not just being on youtube uh, to find a home 
somewhere else, somewhere good. Um, it's not economic driven. It's it's uh, it's for the society. And uh, on the other side, we have the public money, which is not 100 percent, which is just a little bit more. So we can have have it all. You know, use the public money to have a public value. And uh, yeah, but then we have to come together, all of us. You know, the law. The, the state, the the, um, the filmmakers, everybody have to come a little bit closer together. Mm. Yeah. I did want to just clarify that just because people will create for um, uh, intrinsic motivations, that doesn't mean that we should not allow people to live with economic dignity, dignity mm -hmm. and to have like the scope for professional creativity. And this is, I think, really critical. And one of the more radical things that we talk about in the book when we get to proposals is the idea of a jobs guarantee um, that provides like a sort of an, an alternative um, in, in the event that the what's, what's, what's on offer from the, the private sector is so unattractive that you could step into this this other kind of of world and some of the inspiration for this is comes from in the us the new deal and they didn't just finance infrastructure it wasn't just that they made all their highways with this they actually financed thousands of creative jobs during this and so if this is something we really value and and again i think that this this um this emerging era of generative ai is going to turn our attention very quickly to do we care about having humans telling stories and making art? Or is it fine if there are pretty things made by machines? Um, do we want to feel something? Um, then if we want that, then we have to find a way of paying for it. Yeah, I mean, one of, for me, one of the, like, the most compelling things about the book, Rebecca, was the argument that it's not just big tech and big content that are, that are trapped with choke points. It's literally everything. It's 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 every it's every market it's every it's everyone in lots of ways. Well, if there's not a choke point, there's somebody out there trying to figure out a way how to make one. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a better way of describing mm -hmm. it for sure. Um, and you talk about how for this problem to be solved for big tech and big content, we all have to work together. Um, and that's really exciting that there's opportunities for real solidarity and mm. cooperation. Mm. Um, and I'm curious how you all see kind of, like what does that look like practically speaking for all of you? I mean, Rebecca, you mentioned kind of collect, you mentioned a lot of around the solutions, but like collective action, you mentioned mm. the Writers Guild. Could you say a little bit more about that? Mm. Yeah, uh, perhaps I could start with one of the stories that I, I love the most that's in the book is about the, the Uber drivers um, who turned the tables on Uber. So they are some of the most like atomized, vulnerable, exploited, workers that are out there they are surveilled they are rated they are dehumanized um their work just continues to get worse and again it's that intuitification right at the start that they were brought in there um and it was it was better than the alternative of driving a taxi and it just got worse and worse and worse and worse but now you know in a lot of places there are no taxis so you're yeah, they're stuck there and one of the things that that um, was done to them was systemic wage theft but they also had contracts in the United States that said that they were um, they were not employees. They were not entitled to employee protection. If you're in the United States, you're not and you're an, an independent contractor, you're not entitled to unionize. So, like the the weaker and more individualized you are, the less like you are to have like worker protections. Um, and those contracts said that they didn't have the right either to bring a class action, right? If there was anything that went wrong, they only had the right to individual commercial arbitrations. So this is already a terrible injustice, right? Because commercial arbitrations, um, they are paid for by the, the corporation. We know that the, the arbitrators tend to find in favor of the people who are paying for them. They don't have any precedential effect um, and you can't like work together to make them but these Uber drivers, are, are like, with the deck stacked against them so intensely, right? some of them figured out, but what if we all coordinate and tens of thousands of us at once all bring a commercial arbitration action? 
So it's way cheaper for Uber to fight one commercial arbitration action than a class action, but really, really expensive. Like every arbitrator in California was like taken up with these. All right, the cost was just absolutely prohibitive. Uber ran to the court and said, oh, don't let them do this. This is really unfair, right? And in the end, the workers got $150 million, um, you know, through this coordinated action. And I think that... Um, when we come back to the Workers Guild, uh, the, sorry, the Writers Guild, um, when when we had the launch day for this book uh, in in the US, we we had an event in Hollywood, and David Goodman, who was the president of the Writers Guild during that last strike, and who is the um, is the lead negotiator on the current one, he said um, he gave the story of saying that we we thought that our agents had power, we thought our agents had all of the power, and then my wife said to me. Actually, you can have Hollywood without agents, but you can't have Hollywood without writers. And we re when we realized that, we had the power that that changed everything. And I think that we have to realize that we are part of this greater whole, and that's what I talk about. What does I mean, I suppose, when I talk about realizing who are the class allies here um, and working together and rejecting, rejecting this extraction? Yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree. I mean, I think it's about changing the narrative. And and also, as somebody who's working from users' rights perspective, mostly I don't claim to represent creators, um, but but I think what we, what we are trying to do is ultimately to make copyright work for everybody uh, in in the in the kind of in, yeah in, in the whole system, uh, and that that means users and creators. It's not users versus creators. It's not people who want stuff for free. It's not us supporting some kind of, you know, big tech company or anything. Uh, if we, you know, speak out against upload filters, it's because we want to protect freedom of expression. It's not because we want to see uh, the money uh, go into the pockets of, you know, big company companies. It's, uh, And I think that is something we really need to work hard on because um, there, there's still, I think, a lot of divisionary uh, rhetoric uh, in, in the space and a lot of difficulties of, of, of building those uh, relationships and building those alliances. I just had a flashback of, uh, you know, I think us meeting for the first time at the World Intellectual Property Organization a couple of years ago. Uh, extremely <laughs> boring topic, but I think you gave a presentation about reversion rights. And I remember that somebody from, you know, an author's organization was very angry about this um, which doesn't make sense I mean you know reversion rights are very useful for for artists and especially for writers but uh, I think you know those organizations are they, they've existed for a very long time they're very close to publishers organizations uh, sometimes and and that makes it very challenging to really counter this narrative and and come up with uh, something new and I, and I think um, yeah, I mean, also, I mean, maybe we have to become a bit better at, at kind of, um, you know, the solutions um, that we develop. But, but, yeah, I think it's it's mostly about changing the narrative uh, on this one. Yeah, I think you you said all what I th what I think, um, and it's it's really the narration of it and and the, the changing the point of view and uh, not just um, you know. Um, going the traditional way and, you know, go more to digital rights management and, uh, you know, stronger law. And uh, so this doesn't work. And uh, but this this uh, digital world is so different than the, the old analog world that sometimes I feel like it's Chinese and on the other side it's Arabic or something like this and they don't understand each other. And I stood for a long time in the middle of both and I think uh, we really have to find kind of a language, um, you know, to to help each other and to find a way out of this. I think this is really a big point and to change also the uh, the value of, of, of creative workers is also, uh, especially in films, it's also often related to making money, but it's not, uh, that's not always the main value you have to make it that's not what i mean it's you 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 need money to make it and especially film is very expensive but um you have to change your mind to get this money at the end yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess just to end on a note of hope before we go to questions from the audience briefly let's say a question for all of you let's say it's 20 years from now 
you all got everything that you want. Rebecca, people read the book, it had the impact you're dreaming of. Justus, all of Comunia's policy recommendations get adopted. Sandra, everyone watches your films. Everyone, you know, you get calls from people that you, you asking you to make films with them. What does the world look like in 20 years from now if you get everything that you want? Related to this topic. Oh, but yeah. does it really happen? Yeah, because, I mean, because I, I, I actually, no, no, go for it. Go for it. I, I want to say, if 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 all of this <laughs> happens, right? I think that there is a, a broader thing that we can hope for, that people are living lives where they're not super anxious and running at a million miles an hour, always feeling like they're not enough because we have got this growth mindset and everything has to be more and more and more every time, uh, that we are not having to do the bullshit work um, to distract us from the fact that maybe we're not really having the life that is nourishing us and that is um, giving us what we need. Uh, everything slows down. There is more love and there is more connection. Um, and we don't need, we don't have that emptiness inside of us that needs to be filled with ever more production and ever more consumption. Thank you. Sandra? <laughs> it's really difficult, you know, think big. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hope the world is a little bit better because, you know, in my case, I'm talking about documentary movies. It's not all what I do. I also do other stuff, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting the society and I hope um, this, this kind of a feedback loop helps. And if more people watch this stuff and not just you know, mainstream entertainment stuff for, you know, being calm and easy. Perhaps the world is a little bit better. I don't know. Justus? I mean, I, I think as a policy person, if you do your job too well, you're out of a job, uh, of course. Uh, I mean, but, but no, to be honest, I don't think that all of our policy recommendations will be implemented. So I, I think I will still have no, a job. No, in, in this question, they are. Yeah, all yeah, yeah I know. I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to accept the assumption. But, but but in my world, you don't need a job anymore because uh, everything that, is that lovely. Is <laughs> that, that, it's universal <laughs> basic, <laughs> basic <laughs> income for everyone. No, I mean, I, I won't be spamming Cory Doctorow to finally <laughs> co-write my book with him, I think. Maybe I'll take your, uh, your hint there. But... No, somebody will have to um, to make uh, to work to maintain the system. Also, right? I think otherwise it's it's a constant str struggle, and 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 some people will come up with new technology, um, as you know, you mentioned generative AI, but there might be something different on the horizon. And I think we we constantly have to ensure uh, that the system is uh, adjusted uh, to the needs uh, of of you know people, and not just to the needs of technology. And so, yeah, I think that that will be kind of um, my job then, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. Yeah, yes. Good evening. Um, if there w was a encyclopedia publisher sitting on the on the podium, uh, they would tell you about the kind of evil monopoly that Wikipedia has created in this market, um, <laughs> rendering it impossible to make honest money by selling knowledge and making any future endeavors impossible to start new projects because um, Wikipedia's licensing model um, has basically, and its prominent place in search engine, um, result pages um, has created some kind of a monopoly or a, a choke point um, for them. So my question is two part. First, would you um, would you see some of the choke points you described being mirrored in successful open source projects in some way, or are they of a different nature, or are they actually beneficial to some extent. And secondly, you talked about the generative AI and, and as far as I can tell, uh, Wikipedia content is usually at the heart of any large language model um, or um, image uh, creation model uh, with its um, Wikimedia Commons uh, project sister. Um, do, you have, do you all have any recommendations on how Wikimedia should react to being in such a central position um, 
by providing something that might in the long term change society to some, to some extent. Great, thank you so much. Who wants to? Well, I, I think the nature of, of open is like fundamentally contradicts the idea of a choke point, right? So the fact that it's openly licensed, that means other people can come and they can do other things with it if they think that they can do a better job um, and so on, then they can go ahead and do that. So. I, I think those two things have to be fundamentally contradictory. I do think it's really sad that the some of the best intentioned projects in humanity have been what have have powered the create like the the advance of these technologies that um, we're now seeing um, be used to try and e extract. Um, and I'm talking about Wikipedia. I'm talking about the fact that that the um, the alt text that people put on their images, so that people with um, with uh, vision impairments could understand what they were missing from the image. That's what's used the, to 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 train um, mid journey and like the diffusion models, um, and like things like the the, the broader project of of. Uh, the the EU with the the translations as well, like the fact that we have such high quality human done translations between these different languages is also being used. Um, some of this is, I think, being put to use as that to really subvert the intention um, behind it, and that I think is really sad. Um, as for what Wikipedia's response should be, what I would really love to hear is a response from somebody in the room who is from Wikimedia, because I don't want to speak for them. Are there any thoughts about that? Maybe, maybe that's something we can all discuss over yeah. the drinks over the and drinks. food. Yes, later. Should we have shortly. some drinks and yeah, food? Yeah, we should. We'll, we'll, I'll but, just check if these yeah. two have any answers to that question, and then Perhaps we'll go into. I like to add a little bit. I don't. I can't answer your question totally, but it's. Um, um, I made the experience that it's really problematic that uh, the licensing in Wikipedia is uh, CC BY or CC BY SA and just this. Uh, because uh, first I um, released my movie on the uh, CC BY and CSA, so it was clearly non commercial and it doesn't stop uh, teachers to use it or, you know, we have also open educational resources and stuff like this. So, um, it was, it was really fine for the for for everybody, but then I wanted to have to, uh, to do this experiment to put it on uh, Wikimedia, um, Wiki Commons, because um, it's the only platform without a commercial in interest. So um, I took away the NC, and then uh, it started that um, other filmmakers want wanted to use parts of my movie commercially. Uh, without paying for it and um, big funded more money into their movies than in my one and uh, so I had to stop them and I asked Wikimedia once if uh, they have an upload filter for CC by SA <laughs> so um, that uh, you know that you can find a balance between the commercial and uh, you know giving it away for society and um, not um, giving uh, something out there for making more money for other people so i will steer clear of the minefield that is discussions around licenses on uh, <laughs> wikipedia and wiki commons but I, I think your question is obviously interesting because i mean digital platforms come with network effects and and such and so obviously they will gravitate towards <laughs> attracting the, the most successful ones will gravitate towards attracting all of the users and then the other ones become kind of useless at the same time i think what we observe for for the wiki model is that there's tons of little wikis online on a variety of nerdy topics right if you are a harry potter fan there will be a harry potter wiki or a lord of the rings or whatever science fiction uh, wiki for your um, subject and and i think that's great right there's a proliferation of this model and also i think in terms of yes okay there's this this paradoxon of um it it well it, it furthers ai development and if that's something that you intended and you know, uh, if that's something you wanted to do is unclear, of course, right? But um, I think there's also something to learn from the wiki model, which is that people will come together to create mm. as humans and 
use sources. And I think that's, you know, sometimes not so clear for AI models where it's very intransparent, um, you know, in, in terms of what are those models learning from. Um, you know, there, there's really a lack of transparency, obviously. And, and I think so basically I would say, um, you know, uh, as Wikimedia, you can be quite proud of the model. You can show that at least this part is working quite well, uh, is, is, is a model to replicate. And uh, yeah, I mean, um, you know, uh, that, that kind of stands in contrast to AI. Of course, I mean, there, there's still this paradoxon that it also, you know, is, is used to, to teach the model. But um, yeah, that, that's hard to resolve, I think, maybe over drinks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's a great, uh, a great place to end because there's so much more to talk about. I'm sure we've all got many more questions for Rebecca and Justus and Sandra. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we will, I think we have drinks and food outside just here. Thanks. Thank you.